Hi, and welcome to the Compassionate Men's Interview Series. Today, it's my honor to be talking with Dr. Ted Zeff. Dr. Zeff is the author of Raising an Emotionally Healthy Boy, The Highly Sensitive Person's Survival Guide, The Highly Sensitive Person's Companion, and The Strong Sensitive Boy. In addition, he has also been counseling sensitive children and adults for more than 25 years. Welcome, Dr. Zeff. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for inviting me. <clears throat> so, um, I just noticed in my readings of your books, your blogs, um, that there's a lot of talk about compassion. There's a lot of talk about empathy and understanding. And I wanted to ask you some questions in regards to that um, and with your experience of highly sensitive individuals. So the first question I wanted to ask you is, you grew up a highly sensitive boy when, before people even knew what that term was, right? Before there was even the term HSB. And I wanted to ask you, how did you maintain your sensitivity and compassion in the face of social conditioning that I would argue wrings the compassion out of boys? Yeah, and especially when I grew up, I'm a lot older than you. I was, grew up in the 50s and 60s. And... Um, Basically, as most boys in, in that time period, and even nowadays, you have to repress your emotions to be accepted in the violent boy culture. So naturally, I did that. However, being a highly sensitive person, by the way, Elaine Aaron coined the term in 1996, and it was a term waiting to, be, to, to happen because she sold probably close to two million of her books now. My book, The Highly Sensitive, Survive, Highly Sensitive Person Survival Guide, is in five languages and sold over 50,000 copies. And the reason why these books are doing so well is 20% of the population have a finely tuned nervous system. It makes them more sensitive to bright lights, to noise, to crowds. Um, there's a book that came out recently about a year and a half ago called Quiet, The Power of the Introvert in a World That Can't Stop Talking. And Susan Cain was actually on the front cover of Time Magazine the week it came out. It's been in the top 10 best-selling books for New York Times for a year and a half. And what she's talking about a lot of introverts is also people who are highly sensitive. So to get back to your question, I was kind of doing a little introduction, excuse me, for... Uh, <clears throat> diverting a little bit, but so being a highly sensitive person, it's an inborn trait of being compassionate. So even though I had to repress my compassionate side frequently growing up, as many boys do to act tough to be accepted because if they express their true emotions and love and caring, um, they would either be in a homophobic culture, they'd be called gay or or you're not a real boy, boys don't cry, et cetera, et cetera. So, but as we get older, since I'm naturally compassionate, I can only repress it so much. And so the compassionate nature has always been with me. But I imagine it's harder for males who aren't highly sensitive, who don't have that inborn natural trait, who had to repress their natural compassion as you get older to, to gain, get that back again. And of course, one way to get that back is through joining men's groups, through spirituality, for opening your heart, being, if you're heterosexual, being with a woman who's accepting of your sensitivity and making space for it. But I think <clears throat> most men who had to repress their, their sensitive, compassionate side as adults have had to really work at regaining that again. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That's that, you know, you're speaking directly to the work that I'm trying to do. My, my work is cultivating compassion in men and not just highly sensitive men, like you said, who I think have this innate sensitivity to compassion, but um, just all men in general. I think that'll make, I mean, I, I know you believe this too, that'll make the world a better place. Yeah, and basically people who are compassionate and especially we took just the 20% of men who are highly sensitive, who have a hard time with large crowds, working in an aggressive corporation, mm -hmm. pushy, people who are more introverted, like their downtime more. The highly sensitive people, if there was, the whole world was filled with people who are highly sensitive, 
there'd probably be no more environmental destruction, there'd be no more terrorism, there'd be no more wars, mm -hmm. because, but you need a balance in society. This is what Elaine Aaron talked about in her first book. You need the so-called priestly advisors, mm -hmm. the men who, who are traditionally the, the counselors, the advisors, the shaman, mm -hmm. and you also need the warriors. So society mm -hmm. to function in a healthy way, you need the balance. Mm -hmm. and, and you can be a compassionate warrior also. Mm, yeah. You know, I'm going to personalize this a bit, Dr. Zeff. So um, I was a highly sensitive boy. My, my, my mom used the term for me. She said I had glass feelings, right? And, and I felt really sensitive as a child. And to tell the truth, I had that sensitivity. I had that compassion, I'd say, literally beaten out of me. You know, I'm a, I'm a survivor of physical abuse. And, and um, it's only now later in my life that I'm going back and trying to recultivate that what you call innate compassion because I, I had that as a kid and, and I kind of like I toughened up let's say right and, and it wasn't just my stepfather it was society as well so I toughened up and I was wondering if there's a there was a point in your life where um, you had to like you said you had to you had to protect yourself right from a society that would either call you uh, you know homophobic names or say stop crying like a little little girl or something was there a point in your life where you decided you know what I'm going to I'm going to be the compassionate being that I was born to be you know what I mean was there or so Paramahansa Yogananda who was a great spiritual teacher said environment stronger than will and um, I'm jumping ahead to another question I know you had about um, how men who've opened themselves up to women have been put down for it. But I, what I was going to answer to that question, and I'll refer to it now, is yeah, in high school when you're immature and girls go for the macho man, and they've been brainwashed just as much as men, that men have to act tough and be strong and take care of them. Um, but if you're in a different environment, it can change, even if you've gotten the so-called compassion beaten out of you or the sensitivity beaten out of you. So, for example, um, if you're growing up and getting homeschooled or you're going to a, a, a Waldorf or a um, Steiner school where, or a private school that they encourage boys and girls to express their feelings, then, it's, then it'd be natural. But then you go, I remember this one boy went to a, um, a very compassionate alternative school in San Francisco many years ago. I was friends with his mom. And whenever there was a dispute, the teacher would sit down and work it out with the kids. And he ended up going, there was no, it ended in middle school. So in sixth grade, he had to transfer to a very tough inner city uh, middle school. And it was traumatic to be in that environment. And he had to learn real quick that he couldn't just express his feelings and cry and saying, well, that's not very nice. Why are you doing that? So... It's also, I'm going to say this throughout the interview, using your discrimination in terms of what you say to whom is very important. So if you're in an environment with insensitive males or even women who expect men to act insensitive and macho and tough and repress their feelings, you don't say anything. And you try as much as possible not to be in that environment. And then when you're in a safe environment, where you people, pe feel people will respond to you in, in, a, in a positive manner, then you can express your feelings. I just did a, um, uh, an interview last week, a Skype interview with someone in Texas, which is kind of a macho state, and the person, this was actually a woman, not a man, but she said whenever she tells anyone she's highly sensitive, everyone in this little town in Texas would laugh at her. So I said you have to be very discriminating who you reveal what to. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's great advice. Yeah, so let's let's jump to that question that you referred to, right? Um, and it it's this idea that um, you know um, I think men have it really tough in our society, and and obviously highly sensitive men tougher. But you know we're asked to express our emotions. You know, there's this whole movement of like you can't just be that you know macho man anymore. You have to express your emotions. And and society, and I'd say women. You know, they say, why can't you be more emotionally connected? Why can't you show your feelings? Why can't you cry in front of me? And, and I've talked to a number of men who have got this message and then have done that. They've, they've 
opened their heart. They've cried. They've and you know and the response that they've gotten seems to be like shaming and like what are you doing? Like be a man, you know. Like and and often that response comes from women. And you mentioned like the high school phenomena of like um, girl high school girls being friends with sensitive males, but then dating the aggressive alpha male. Um, and so I'm wondering, do we need to work on the other side of the gender line? Do do um, do we have any like suggestions on how to shift the perspective of the highly sensitive man, but just the sensitive, just men being sensitive um, in terms of how women view that? Well, as I just did mention earlier that the women have been brainwashed just as much as the men. And even women who are uh, feminists or, or, or want e more equality and ask men to open up, they have to work an awful lot of them on themselves about when a man does open up, as you said, and not to shame them. And because it's so ingrained in society from the time a little girl is born that um, daddy, men, you know, everyone, the male is supposed to be the protector and the strong one and take care of the, 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 the feminine. Even though, even if, even women who say, no, no, I want, I want you to be more expressive and all that, do they really? So it's so crucial for them to work on themselves. One study I like to refer to is there was a study done that showed infant boys, like six months old, were actually more emotionally reactive than infant girls. But by the time a boy reaches the age of four, five, or six, he's learned to repress every emotion except anger. Because anger is the only emotion society tells a boy that he's allowed to have. So, and then they wonder why when boys grow up to be men, they can't express their sensitive part, their compassion, their love, and open up because they've been told, what are you, a little girl? What are you, a sissy? Boys don't cry. And over and over again, you hear it. As a matter of fact, on Elaine Aaron's questionnaire on the highly sensitive person, everything was pretty equal between men and women, except for the response to uh, about males crying. Do you cry much? And men, even highly sensitive men, put no, because it's like the biggest shaming thing to, to, to cry. It actually reminds me I was at the VA hospital and I saw a sign there um, because men are also told never to ask for help and be independent and tough it out. And there's a huge sign saying, it takes the strength of a warrior to ask for help. If you're in an emotional crisis like PTSD from being in, in, in Iraq or Vietnam or whatever, um, it takes the strength of a warrior to ask for help. Please ask for help now for your emotional crisis. But men are told... Don't even ask for directions if you're going somewhere. We have the GPS now, but up to the GPS, um, we couldn't even ask for directions. You can never ask for help. And, and, and the consequences are absolutely horrific on men, physically and emotionally. Why do you think men get more heart attacks and die much younger than women in a marriage? Why are there so many widows? Because men have to keep all that emotion bundled up inside, creating high blood pressure, heart disease, Etc. Etc. Oh, I don't have anything wrong with me. I won't go to the doctor. They can't admit weakness, and it's a real endemic problem in, in virtually every society in the world. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It, it reminds me of, you know, I, I got to ask Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist monk, about compassion, and I said, you know, like, yeah, you know, I was raised a man in Western society. Like, compassion's a weakness. You know, he said, and he said, that's a fundamental misunderstanding. Compassion will make you healthier, it will, it's strength, it's power. And, and then he said this great phrase, he said, compassion will protect you more than guns, bombs, and money. You know, and, and I, I, I think that's similar to what you're saying and similar to what you do in your practice, which, which I thank you for. So let me ask you another question. Um, you often state the importance of role models, right? Finding um, sensitive male role models for your sensitive child, but just role models in general. And I, I wanted to ask you, who were your compassionate male role models, if you had them, and how did they nurture your compassion? Well, what's interesting is growing up, my dad was not a highly sensitive person. He could tune out anything, noise, bright lights, crowds, nothing bothered him. But for some reason, he was one of the most compassionate people I've ever met. 
all he cared about, not all, but when, I mean, his whole life was dedicated to helping suffering humanity. He was a big fan of um, uh, what's the charity um, without uh, Physicians Without Borders and Amnesty International and very compassionate. So I was lucky that I saw growing up a male role model who emphasized the need to help suffering humanity. So even though he wasn't an HSP at all. So that, that was interesting. But, you know, people could find it. Even someone like kids watching Mr. Rogers TV show. Where, I mean, like, that's a beautiful role model for boys. And even someone like our current president, Obama, who will say, let's mediate, let's try and talk it out rather than fighting, bombing the country first. And let's, let's oh, let's try and work things out. Of course, it's had detrimental effects in, in, in the government because some people don't want to work things out. But just seeing a strong man as president who doesn't want to bomb the country first and wants to try and negotiate with people and willing to talk to people. So there are people in the media, you have to look for them, or you know, in society, um, some movie stars even, although the typical male movie star is just horrendous, and sports hero, although I have a section in my book, Raise an Emotionally Healthy Boy, about male sports heroes who are compassionate. You know, someone like uh, Jesse Owens, someone like even Jackie Robinson, how he learned to repress his anger, and that became a, became a way to, su to survive and succeed. Um, Roberto Clemente, who was killed in a car, in a uh, airplane crash, delivering goods to Nicaragua after an earthquake, famous baseball player from, I think, the 50s and 60s. Um, so you can find male sports heroes, even, who are compassionate, but unfortunately, the ones we usually see are the ones who are not so compassionate. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me uh, talk to you about spirituality, and it's a big part of what I what I'm actually doing. And so, um, under the positive traits of the sensitive man or the sensitive boy, you list quote an awareness of his unity with all beings unquote and quote the ability to have and appreciate deep spiritual experiences, unquote. You also state that it would, quote, be beneficial to encourage your HSB, your highly sensitive boy, to develop his spiritual side. I have two questions for you on that. Um, one, did you have a deep spiritual experience being a highly sensitive boy? And two, is spirituality part of how you, you quote, claim that the sensitive men can save the planet. I mean, that's one of your uh, articles on your blog, right? The sensitive men can save the planet. Is, is spirituality a part of that saving of the planet? Sure. Well, let me answer the first one. Highly sensitive people generally have a, a very rich inner life and have deep spiritual experiences because the nervous system is so attuned, it's attuned e even deeply to, to psychic and spiritual areas. And actually, I remember when you asked that question, I remembered how I was nine years old and I was standing on the front lawn of my house and all of a sudden I felt like I left my body. I just, my body froze and I said, wait a minute, where am I? These aren't my parents. This isn't my house. I'm from another place. And I had this very deep spiritual experience of just basically leaving my body and feeling like this wasn't my real home, the earth plane, that I'm, I'm, there's somewhere else that's deeper. So that was really neat. And of course, when I told my mom about it, she goes, oh, it sounds like you had a dizzy spell or something. But I knew that, that later on that that was my first deep spiritual experience. And as sen most sensitive people have experiences of one kind or the other, either through dr deep dream work, kind of like from a Jungian perspective. Carl Jung was a, a highly sensitive person where you're getting lots of information from other levels besides just the gross physical level. And in terms of the second part of the question, absolutely that, like I mentioned earlier, if you were a spiritual person, like if you're a follower of the Dalai Lama or the hugging Saint Ama, you're not going to um, want to start bombing countries and being rude because if you follow the Buddhist or a lot of the Hindu teachings of compassion, or for that matter, if you follow the true teachings of Christ or of Judaism, they're all talking about love your neighbor, being kind to your neighbor. But of course, the ego 
takes everything out of context. And why do you think we had the Crusades where, oh, we're going to kill people for Christianity? But the true essence, Jesus said, turn the other cheek, you know, if someone strikes you. So, but people, you know, there aren't any really, a lot of people who are true Christians or even the Jewish religion, which is the Talmud, where you talk a lot about, you know, caring about other people and being righteous and, and doing kind acts. So people who are following not so much a religion that can be um, changed to fit someone's ego and distorted, but following the true essence of spirituality, which is compassion for all sentient beings, then, then you've got compassion. So that's why I think it's so important for people to go to the essence of any religion or spirituality, ality, spirituality that teaches compassionate behavior. Mm. Yeah. You know, just thinking about, like you mentioned Carl Jung was a, a highly sensitive boy, and um, you also mentioned Mozart in your book. But I was thinking about, you, Excuse me. you mentioned Mozart, right? Mozart, yes. Yeah. yeah. So I was thinking about when you talk about um, another part of, I think it's on your blog, you talk about like expose your, your son to um, compassionate um, role models in history. And, and, and you mentioned two that I think are interesting. I think the Buddha had to be a highly, highly sensitive boy, right? I mean, because that's, a, that's the whole practice is building that sensitivity in your in yourself and then treating it with equanimity. And then the other person you mentioned is uh, Sir, uh, St. Francis de Assisi, right? And and the research I've done on St. Francis, he seemed like he was a highly sensitive boy as well. And I'm wondering totally. if, um, I think he, you, you draw that connection between spiritual leaders and highly sensitive boy, but I'm wondering if you can look back in history and see them as highly sensitive boys by what you've heard about them or, or read about them. You know, a lot of people are saying, oh, this person's highly sensitive, that person was who's deceased from history, and it's really hard to know. Some people on some HSP, highly sensitive person websites, will say Lincoln was. But again, you, you know, 200 years, from, 200 years from now, they might say, oh, Obama was a highly sensitive person. I don't think he was highly sensitive in the sense of being sensitive to crowds and bright lights and noise. Uh, and just seeing the way he can tune things out, which you'd have to have a pretty tough skin to be president of the United States or any CEO of a corporation or anyone in that role. But they were at least very compassionate people. And I go back to like my dad, who was not a highly sensitive person at all in terms of being sensitive to physical stimuli, but he was very compassionate. So you could be compassionate and not be an HSP. Mm. Yeah, that's that's the key, right? Is is to de develop that compassion, even if you're not one of those lucky 20%. That's the first time I've heard that for a while. Unfortunately, many of my people, uh, uh, people I do consultation with say, oh, it's so hard being an HSP and so great to hear you say the lucky 20% because it is a special trait. Where HSPs are very responsible. They can appreciate beauty, nature, music, fine tastes. Uh, you know, there's so many positive aspects about being a sensitive person, but you also have to manage that trait because it's very easily to get thrown off course in a society that not only is not sensitive, but disrespects frequently people who are. Um, let me ask you about um, something that is in your new book. And, and um, it's this idea that, you know, that the strong sense, the, the, sorry, the aggressive non-emotional male needs to learn to emulate the behavior of the compassionate, emotionally sensitive male to become what you claim is uh, a functioning human being, a fully functioning human being. And um, that, that kind of segues because that makes the sensitive male like, you know, a, a gift to the rest of society. And, and they're lucky that they're, they're going to be that leader. But my question is, how can we increase this interaction? How can we increase that, that, that swapping of sensitivity and compassion when we live in a society where media and gender stereotypes celebrate the aggressive traits of the, the non-highly sensitive man, where it seems like, you know, what you want to be is the tough guy. You want to be the, you know, the guy who feels no pain, you know, the guy who... Who who keeps going 
regardless of how many people are trying to tackle him, let's say in football. Um, how do we shift that to make that inner interaction happen where the compassion is coming from the sensitive boys? So that's basically what my book is. Raise an emotionally healthy boy, save your son from the violent boy culture. And there's hundreds and hundreds of suggestions how parents can raise boys to deal, to cope with the aggressive violent boy culture. And it could be anything from discussing with your son, what it, for a dad to discuss with, with his son what it really means to be a man, and for the dad to go through some kind of realization about his own repressed emotions and what he's internalized himself. It could mean um, father and son going out on a weekend and doing compassion acts like volunteering at a nursing home or planting trees, um, uh, doing charitable work, uh, just reading books, watching uh, movies about St. Francis of Assisi or Christ about the real heroes, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, talking about the men who are, have been compassionate, who've really saved the planet. So there's a lot you can do. There's a lot you can do with schools. You can try and work with the teachers, with the principal, about gi giving rewards for, for children who are being kind rather than just the one who win, wins in a football game or a soccer game. So... There's so many things in the book, so many hundreds of suggestions of introducing children to nonviolent video games um, that can really help picking, making sure their friends are nonviolent and discussing it. Uh, and it's true, if, in their, if they're in society going to a, a, a tough public school, it's not going to be easy. But you, a parent has to decide, well, is it worth it for my child to go to a school where they're becoming more violent? Or should I just homeschool them, look for an alternative school that, that's more gentle, <clears throat> will teach the values that I want my child to have, so, uh, or look for a public school that really has like a no bullying policy where teachers and the, the whole theme of the school is to be kind to other children. So if they're getting that basis, especially their first 10, 12 years, I think I even say in the book, even if when they're teenagers and a boy's hanging out with other boys who are acting tough and putting down gays or, or making girls seem you know like they're just an object, and they know differently, and they if they they know if they express their true feelings, they would get put down. They could just you could just tell them it's just a silly game that these immature people have to play, and just like you go out and you play some game, when you come back home, you could be your real self. So yeah. So maybe in a school setting or even college, like I remember, you know, when I was in a college fraternity, it was just so homophobic and sexist and just horrendous. And it was just a game. You know, it was just like, okay, so I have to act this way here to get accepted by him, but I know that's not really true. And then when you get to be older and you're out of college and you're on your own, you can start doing you can be in a more of a, a true environment where you can express your real self. I remember one man I interviewed for the strong, sensitive boy worked in a corporate world where it was real cutthroat and everyone was being very um, cruel to each other to get to the top. And he developed so many symptoms of like ulcers and headaches and gastrointestinal problems. And whenever he tried to express his real self, well, why don't we try this? Because sensitive people are very, very creative. We're the artists and musicians and writers. They didn't want to know about it. No, it's to win, to make more money. Who cares about your creative ideas? He finally quit the job, and he started his own company where he was his own boss. He created his own environment, and all his physical symptoms went away. So again, it's so very important for men who, whether they're highly sensitive or not, in order to be compassionate, cannot be in an environment that is violent and uncompassionate because that just reinforces all the sickness of society mm. to be in that environment and then you start believing it also. Yeah, yeah. And l let me qu clarify something real quick, Dr. Zeff. So when you talk about that father-son interaction, you're not just talking about highly sensitive fathers. You're talking about all fathers, right? Sensitive yeah. or, or, or yeah, not? As a matter of fact, this, the last book I wrote, Raising an Emotionally Healthy Boy, save your son from the violent boy culture, 
is more geared to boys who aren't highly sensitive. Mm. More boys who would just, you know, don't, you know, they, they find hanging out with crowds and loud noises and all this, you know, whatever, um, whatever uh, would bother a highly sensitive person. It wouldn't bother these boys, but it's also to how to instill compassion in them. Mm. Great. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, so my last question is to you. Well, let, yeah, I'm going to make it my last question, but I might have a follow up. Um, sure. Do you practice cultivating compassion um, or do you have a daily like um, activity that you do that centers you, that helps you? Um, I, I know you have that innate compassion in you as a highly sensitive person, but do you do you practice something that um, kind of like lets it out or reassures it? And if you do, um, what, what is that practice? Well, not only compassion, but for grounding for people who are sensitive or even grounding for people who aren't highly sensitive is so important if you're going out into a society where you're getting blown off center easily. So um, for many years, since the 80s, I've meditated daily. And in the book, The Highly Sensitive Person Survival Guide, I recommend people getting up a little earlier each day and spending some time reading something spiritually uplifting, meditating, writing in a journal, doing something to ground themselves. Um, and so uh, for many years, I've actually, I used to be uh, doing a lot of the techniques that Paramahansa Yogananda taught, Self-Realization Fellowship, and I've actually lived in Amma's ashram for 18 years, the Hugging Saint. Yeah. For, for 18 years you yes. live with Amma? What, in Amma's in, ashram in, in, in California. In Kerala? No, in, here in, in, in California. In San Ramon? Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. I know. I was going to say that. So I usually never share that, but so as you see, I've been on a very deep spiritual path, and before that, I lived in a in a spiritual community based on Yogananda's teachings for many years. Down in San so, Diego, is that the one? The no, it was up in Northern California. Wow! But, but at any rate, the point is, is that so I've been immersed a lot of my adult life in in, in re spiritual readings, and and the more you read spiritual books and meditate and have satsang, which is yeah. um, getting together with other like-minded spiritual people, the more that compassion can grow and the more the, the, the whims and silliness of society become less important. Wow. wow. I, I, I never knew that about you, Dr. I mean, you know, but it makes sense now because you know why I found your book? At Amas, at, at San Ramon. You found it there in the bookstore. There, right? I've, I've. That's where my wife bought the book, and I'm like, that's Wait, which book did you buy there? We bought the uh, because our son is a sensitive boy, so we bought the strong sensitive boy there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That now it makes sense, right? Yes. Now it makes sense. So, so that's wonderful. That's great to hear. Um, yeah, and then the other thing I noticed in in the um, sensitive person companion, you also state um, mindful eating, like you said, one meal a day, or was it one meal a day? You just just turn off the phone. You don't no TV and mindful eating, and and I think that's that's a wonderful practice as well. I, I knew you had to, had to have that, some sort yeah, of yeah. That's being and it's hard to do it because everything in society is you watch a screen while you eat or you talk in intense conversation, and it's hard for me too. But every once in a while, I'll get that awareness and try and do it. But it's like Eckhart Tolle talks about the power of now. Yeah. So the more you're in the present moment. Then, then, then things can 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 grow spiritually more, because if you're always focused on the future, worrying about the future, or remunerating about what happened in the past, then you can't really tune into your deep spiritual self. Wow! Yeah, that that's beautiful. I, I I think that's a great way. That's a great way to end it. Thank you so much, Doctor Zev. I mean, I'm blown away. I just just a just a that that's. You're 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 at such a higher level. I mean, I I, I really appreciate that. More level and, might be more accurate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you gotta be. You know, in order to grow, you gotta get rid of the ego. So if you think you're on a higher level, yeah, that keeps you more stuck in the egoic sense of me and mine. Yeah. Which I read on your blog how when I think you were at Amma's, you got into this like, oh, Amma gave me a special hug or something. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. So that and that's what Amma always does, and the great spiritual teachers have done is always do things. To, to, to break down the ego of, of, the, of the seeker. Yeah. So, and anything, anything that I do that 
that I feel is helping society is nothing to do with my ego, Ted Zeff, but I, I feel like the divine energy of Amma or, or other spiritual teachers or the divine God coming through because I wouldn't, because it was up to me, I would just be judging people and <laughs> always thinking about the past and the future. But because I have been trying at least, not so successfully, I've been trying to meditate for so many years and read spiritual books and attend satsang, I think something kind of I opened up in me where I can um, you know, express some good values. Well, I, you know, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for, for that service that you're doing, for that you know, that seva that you are doing and, and for cultivating compassion, I mean, for cultivating compassion as a sensitive man, but also cultivating compassion through your books, through your teaching, through your, through your counseling. And, and um, I believe as you do that that's going to save our species that, you know, that compassion. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart for all that you do along those lines. And I really appreciate you being here today. Namaste.